Let me now introduce Manuela Veloso. Um, she's the Herbert A. Simon University professor, and she's the head of the machine learning department at Carnegie Mellon University. And she's going to tell us now about autonomous machines interacting with humans. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about these uh, machines, autonomous machines, and uh, their interactions with humans within the context of actually this quest for autonomy that drives AI that was mentioned before in trying to integrate a perception problem, uh, where am I, the state of the world, with a cognition about making decisions and learning and actually deciding what's best and eventually the actual actuation. So we have been studying this in many uh, the robotic environments. I have been doing research on autonomous robots for over 30, I mean, for over 20 years. And um, these, today I'm going to focus on these specific robots, which are these um, service robots. They are uh, robots that have wheels, in some sense, they to navigate, so not arms to manipulate, but basically focus more on the actual motion of the robots. And they are capable of performing tasks because they end up being a computer that has cameras and is, is on wheel, has wheels. So all the thinking eventually happens in that laptop and the actuations are their motion and their, uh, their perception is through cameras. So I'm going to first explain very briefly uh, how exactly they, I mean a little bit about how they work, and then I'll focus on explaining uh, the interaction of these robots, these cobots, collaborative robots, with uh, uh, people. So these robots basically move like these at Carnegie Mellon and at other uh, institutions, and I'll mention in a second. So they just go down corridors, and they uh, beautifully, in some sense, and very accurately, stop at the right place. So they are asked, come to my office, and these robots move around. So let's just delve of what's happening, very, very kind of light, and uh, uh, in terms of like a uh, focus on what's happening. So these robots have as sensors, basically two uh, devices. So they have a laser, a laser range finder, and uh, they have actually also a connect, which is a camera that gives you uh, RGB and depth. So I'm, focused, I'm going to be focused on the connect, and the connect is positioned uh, up in the robot uh, so that it can cover a view of, a 3D view of the environment. Uh, this is a view of the connect. And why do we care about this 3D view of an environment when we have a mobile robot? The idea is that robots, to move, their only function or their most important function is to avoid obstacles. So when we have a, mo a successful mobile robot, it does not bang into the walls constantly. So it's capable of finding where are the walls and eventually move around the walls. If people come by, it's supposed to not just um, hit obstacles. So mo in uh, robotics, in AI that applied to robotics, we have a lot of like research on this obstacle avoidance, on obstacle detection, on all sorts of like uh, ability to know how far the obstacle are so the robot can uh, maneuver around the obstacle. So it's all about obstacles and therefore when we have this connect uh, device that can give you distance to such obstacles, then the robot can plan what to do as a function of their distance and eventually take the right turns. So, but this, uh, this particular image, which this grayscale shows basically uh, depth, this is what these kind of like colors means, is challenging from a, process, uh, from a uh, practical point of view, but this robot actually uses these depth images to find walls in the, uh, in its environment. So why are walls and specific kind corner of the building and all sorts of like this vertical space that delimits our, uh, the, the environment important? Because if you have, a, if the robot has a map 
like the floor plan of the building, learned or acquired, this map defines lines in the space and the robot will know eventually when it gets to the end of this corridor and needs to turn. So I'll show you what it does and I'll try to explain because this is like the, the navigation part and then, uh, so this is basically how the robot localizes and navigates. So it has some kind of map as I told you, it could be learned or acquired, but the outcome of the map is a series of lines of vector-based representation that the robot is able to use to uh, map what it sees in the image to uh, this map. Uh, let me tell you that I'm going to start this and then I'll, s I'll, I'll finish, in, I'll stop in a second, just to tell you that a robot, um, in terms of its position, always has uncertainty about the exact location where it is. Uncertainty, it's not really uncertainty, am I in Paris or am I in Washington DC or am I in Pittsburgh? But it's uncertainty like uh, uh, in the X, Y coordinates of the space, am I in the point minus 13.3 comma 22 or minus 13.9 and 25? So there is uncertainty with respect to the exact XY location in its space. We represent this uncertainty here by showing you these multiple orange circles that represent different levels of confidence that the robot, which is represented as an uh, orange circle with some kind of orientation, thinks that it can be in any of these positions. So here is the robot, and I stopped the video, and this robot is kind of a little bit lost in the sense that it could be here, it could be there. It's, in fact, there are the circles go, uh, really, the uncertainty is not just like, uh, is local, but it could also spread, and it could even, even have other points, it might think. Does not necessarily need to be Gaussian around the point. But this robot is kind of a little bit uncertain. I want you to focus on this image, which is the image that the robot is perceiving with its depth camera. And this image has this floor, which happens to be uh, represented in color just for distance, but the floor does not give you, in this algorithm, enough information. And when the robot, about localization, and then the robot starts moving, it's a very beautiful moment here when the robot actually, and I'm going to stop exactly, when right here, where it starts detecting that corner, this blue thing, it sees a vertical wall at some distance, and then the robot starts saying, oh, maybe then if I see it at that distance, I am here rather than there or rather than here. And there you go, it sees the whole corner and beautifully it reduces its uncertainty about where it is and navigates exactly knowing its position. Humans in the image, like we see here, are ignored in terms of localization, but are taken into account in terms of navigation, so the cobot does not run over anyone in the environment, so that you should, be, you should feel happy about that. So, um, so these robots uh, do have this um, ability to move in our environments, and they navigate uh, very difficult environments in terms of perception, large open areas. They have like these uh, very kind of like uh, challenging uh, bright areas with uh, glass bridges that have a lot of like uh, light and they keep going in this environment and uh, successfully going from place to place and this has been, uh, was the thesis of my student Joy Deep Bisvaz, uh, who is now at UMass Amherst. And just to finish one second here, to prove that it's very well localized is that in this transition from wood to carpet, it's supposed to slow down and according to the definition of that little bump that you were supposed to slow down and it slows down at the right place. Let me just highlight one more thing that's very important. Because of this localization, our robots also are capable of navigating in this space of our corridors and gather maps of the vitals of the building very accurately. In this particular case, Richard Wang's PhD thesis, one of my students, uh, is capable of moving the robot and building maps, for example, of Wi-Fi signal strength 
uh, exactly in all the points of the environment, and he collected data on temperature, humidity, all sorts of other vitals. So it, we are used to robots thinking about robots only as service robots, but service can all, these robots can also be uh, data collectors, mobile data collectors, on these uh, mapping these into a very precise maps given their accurate localization. So we are also able to move in any environments. This is just the last video I'll show you of the, the robots moving in different environments. This is at NYU. I was on sabbatical there 2013-14, and Joydeep and the robots and my students came, and here it is the robot in a completely different environment. We got the floor plan, the architectural plans of the building, uh, this CUSP uh, center at NYU, and Wonderfully, the robot navigated there during the whole summer, and after a couple of days, it was moving everywhere, precisely going to all the office space uh, points in the building. So, just to tell you, to, to, to mention this, I think it's quite, uh, how do you say, compelling that these robots move at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, they move daily. Uh, any visitor that comes to come my office is escorted by Cobot. Cobot meets you at the elevator, and uh, you just say, follow the robot, and Cobot just takes you to my office. And several of you have experienced this all already. If not, please come to Carnegie Mellon, and I'll be happy to have the robot escort you to my office. And uh, they have moved for more than 1,000 kilometers, uh, probably now close to 1,300, 1,400. I have to update this number. And they move in all these nine floors of the building, any different buildings. Okay, so the rest of the talk, uh, which is exactly half, I'm just going to focus on the another aspect. Now that they move, now that they can reliably perform tasks, you can ask me, but um, they have limitations. So you, as you notice, they do not have arms. They cannot pick up objects. They cannot put objects. They cannot get, uh, carry objects. They cannot press elevator buttons. They actually w cannot open all the doors of the world. So there is this kind of like um, uh, assessment or that these robots, after all, even if I would put an arm on these robots, even if we do a lot of deep learning, and maybe 10 years from now they will be able to, do, to know much more, but they have limitations. And when I think a little bit more from a philosophical point of view, I actually dare to say that they might always have limitations in the same way that humans individually also have limitations. I speak with an accent, but I do play squash, and I do, play, I do uh, speak five languages, and I have all other skills, but I have limitations. I cannot reach that tall. So what I'm saying is that I realized early on that maybe these AI machines will always have limitations, and one day I said, okay, it's okay for a robot to have limitations, at least for now, so, or for always. So we actually devised a new way of thinking about autonomy and robots in which robots ask for help. So when they are not capable of doing something or when they are not able to understand something or when they are not able to find something, they don't stop. They just say, I can't do it. So at the beginning, at CMU, that glass bridge was very hard for the robot to traverse through its perception. And so the robot would stop at one end of the bridge and say, may I follow you? And it would go down this bridge following a person, would change its behavior so that it would not be like actually uh, processing walls or planar surfaces, but it would just follow the person. As soon as it would get to the other side of the bridge, it would say, thank you, I'm done with you, you can do it. This is how Cobot takes the elevator. Uh, it's nine floors, as you see, doesn't cannot press, but it gets to the, the elevator and it just screams loud, can you please push the up button and hold the elevator door? And so this robot is there, incapable of actually doing this task, and, but it knows that that slice of the task, can't do, asks the human which elevator, and this is Stephanie Rosenthal's uh, PhD work, which of these elevators, and Stephanie says the right one, holds the door, the robot gets into elevator by itself, 
which is great, is inside of the elevator and also says, well, can you please press eight and tell me when we get there? When the human generously says, you are there, the robot leaves. So this is fundamental now, and it has been shaping a lot of my research, this concept that AI machines have limitations, and some of you might ask, instead of waiting for the end of the, 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 the talk, you can ask, what if people don't help the robot? What if people tell the robot is on eight and is on fourth floor? What if people don't like this robot to ask questions, right? So these are all legal questions. If nobody really helps the robot, the robot actually sends us email. You know, I've been here waiting for a while <laughs> and nobody helped me. Can you please come and help me? So there is this concept of full autonomy. In fact, you can block Cobot by standing in front of it but there is nothing wrong, it doesn't do anything. It just says, please excuse me, please excuse me. It does not let you go, it's in me email. I've been here three minutes waiting, I cannot move, come and rescue me. <laughs> and there's an, an interesting thing, so it sends to all of us in the group, and sometimes I'm teaching a class and I get an email from Cobot somewhere. But my students, eventually someone, we go there. So there is this thing about, how do you say, completing its sound limitations or complementing by asking for help and then we can let it go. So it also has a very, uh, very nice ability to, to, to process spoken language. Bring Blizzakov. So, I don't know where is a coffee in the building. Very nice. So what happens is like this, now the robot is done. I did not know where coffee was. I thought the lab was 7412. The human generously said, yes, 7412 is right. The web generally said, generously said, okay, there is high probability that it's in the kitchen. So now I want to ask you like this, how is this robot going to get coffee in the kitchen? <laughs> how is it? Ask for help, there you go. You are all great researchers. So, and let's see what it does, right? It's he, hello. There's Mehdi Samadi who did all the web analysis. And there you go. Thank you, Thank you I'm done, and there I'm going. But this is not a video that I make for you. This happens all the time. Notice how beautiful this robot has a basket. It does not have arms but it has a basket. A basket is almost as good as arms. Don't tell this to my manipulator co colleagues because the basket enables this robot to take things from place to place. So this is it. Now what's interesting about these, the first kind of like a cognitive aspect of these robots is that they actually learn. As soon as the web told this machine that coffee had high probability of, it, of being in the kitchen, and the human conferred and said, yep, the kitchen is the right place, and yes, 7412 is the small size lab, it's the lab. The robot grounds all that information, and it learns that these terms, Manuela's office, the lab, coffee, kitchen, all map to these kind of like Lo locations that it knows about. So it's the robot has all this knowledge, 7412, 7602, which are locations in a map, and it's capable of actually talking about this, uh, remembering. The last topic, uh, which is the last uh, four minutes or five, I'm going to tell you about this issue, about the mis the, how myster mysterious it is, this autonomy. So when we see things moving, robots moving, you wonder what are they doing, how are they doing, why are they doing. So as an example, I'll show you a video of robot soccer, which I've done for a long time. And you can see these robots autonomously playing soccer. And you basically, have, there is a little ball that's hard to see. You basically don't really know what they are doing. I mean, you see, oh, they passed, that's great, what well, they did it, and they scored. 
So we basically, I'll show you one more time, there is this, so this autonomy run by some deep learning or by some algorithms, in this case algorithms, you wonder, in fact, what is happening? So we have been passionate about this question about what's happening. If I show you, oops, sorry, if I show you the same video now, oops, with the explanation of what's happening, that robot is thinking about passing to these four. I slowed this, ro this video down so you can, we can explain that this robot is going to pass to that point. Look at how we now know that this robot is going to pass. This robot is passing to that point over there. There it goes again, what's happening? It evaluates an open pass shot at the goal, gets some probability. The prediction immediately that the ball is going to go there, there's where the robot is there, is going to pass to that point, and eventually it goes all the way there. This one misses the pass, thinks that it can shoot from there, misses the path, goes on, robotics uncertainty at its best, and eventually also plans what should you do, and you, you, you score. But look how our relationship with these machines may change if they actually explain what their program is doing. So we, now, watching these uh, robot soccer games, if we put on these videos everything that the robots are doing from a computational point of view, we actually understand what's going on. So Danny Zeus' thesis, uh, my student, is all about this, uh, in particular, overlaying over the videos everything the robots are doing. But just for the cobot, I'm going to tell you that this arrival of the cobot to my office is of great disturbance. Because it arrives to my office, and I don't know where it's coming from, and I wish I would, uh, could ask, what are you going to do next? Where do you come from? Why are you late? How long did you take you to come here? So this thing is so autonomous, and now it became a research question, how do we answer these questions? How can we set these questions to the robot without having to program and find out from the logs what happened? In language, how do we go about finding this out? So we engaged on this problem of trying to have the robot explain and answer questions. So from all the low levels of the robot, which happens to be distances to walls that I explained to you a little bit, all sorts of thresholds, lives in the world of probability, in the world of thresholds, in the world of derivatives. How do we translate all of that? Imagine it's like coordinates of the world, minus blah blah, minus 16, minus 433 orientations. This is the world of a mobile robot. And I want to understand more in terms of like office and stairs and bathrooms and kitchens. How do we do this mapping? And more, and the robot does whole paths. It goes from here, sequence of things, until it arrives to my office. Traverses the world by itself, comes all the way here. Our cell phones don't go anywhere. Our refrigerators don't go anywhere. Our mobile robots go by themselves around this building, three, 350 offices, and they arrive to your door. So now we came up with this kind of like concept of verbalization. They are able to actually explain to us what they have done in different levels of detail. They can come to our office and I you, uh, uh, hope you can have a chance of looking at the papers and they can describe their experience. Still very not very interesting. It doesn't say, oh, I saw a flower blooming on the way here. Or it's just very, as of now, it's very functional. And now I can, uh, from here, you know, I know it came through this route. I know that it went through the seven floor bridge and I, can, I know more than I used to know. But this is the infancy of trying to make these machines more clear. And in this verbalization space, we actually learn what humans want to say. So if the human says, tell me exactly how you got here, and then, okay, only tell me about room 7004, the robot, the explanation, jumps to another point in this verbalization space in which it tells more details about 7004, or the human may say, can you only give me a brief summary? And again, that's another point in this verbalization space. So now our robots, this is the thesis of Vittorio Pereira, now our robots, and joined with Stephanie Rosenthal, our robots are about, oh, I mean this world of explanations is the same way that I'm on the world and mobility. 
So the only thing I want to tell you now, which is really nobody saw these three last slides yet because they are research as we go, is that this, in this interaction with humans and this ability to have to talk with humans, I told you, I mean, offices and elevators, we really actually uh, entered this uh, information and now we are trying to learn it all from actually images. So we are trying to find out uh, that you actually, based on all the deep learning results, we can try to now merge all this classification of scenes to symbols and have the robots say, I think I'm near the kitchen because I can see a microwave and a sink, and eventually also find uh, if you are on the fourth floor, on the sixth floor, on the eighth floor, by having p features of these. So uh, this is just to tell you that in this connection of perception, cognition, and action, we have been moving uh, back and forth and uh, trying to, um, uh, as much as possible, making the robot function all together and filling in when something comes that can be actually compelling from a learning point of view and generali generalizable uh, from a learning point of view. And just so, the last thing is that I got these videos from my student Cheng Wei Tzu uh, last night and I want to share them with you because they are re it's remarkable. Don't put your expectations very high, but I'm going to explain to you what this is. The problem is that, ro the, our, so let me just stop this. Our cobot, you know, has ver is very good at bringing me something to my office. Ignores all the people that they find on the way. Well, it doesn't run over them, but, so that doesn't, I mean, doesn't ignore at that level. But if someone comes and says, hi, cobot, da 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 da, nothing. Or if someone comes towards it, nothing. So this kind of robot does not go to people, does not uh, understand this concept of seeing someone moving, slowing down, and wanting to intercept that person or stopping. So we have been trying to do her, uh, her work is about trying to do these kind of like more social, so this robot is more aware that there are people around. And so here's a problem in which the robot actually strained, the robot is the blue thing, on trying to intercept a person and at the beginning knows nothing. And here is after deep learning, it can intercept every person, every direction, every speed, and more, if it has more than one person, it will intersect first one, then the other, without any additional training. In fact, we are generating this video with thousands of people moving and the robot check marks them all without any additional training. So just very excitingly, I just share with you this very exciting concept but of human AI interaction in some sense, not human machine interaction, not human robot interaction, but human AI, which are these intelligent autonomous machines and how they interact with humans. And from the human side, we request, we request tasks, we provide help, we instruct, we train and correct. And from the AI side, we have to do all this integration all the way to generating and learning explanations. Thank you very much. Great, I think we'll have time for one or two questions here. Anybody want to go to a microphone? Yes. Can your train rabbit robots immediately train another robot, and transfer the information instantly? So it's a very good question. Indeed, we have four cobots and uh, they all share what they have learned. So if you ask Cobot 2, uh, go to the kitchen, then Cobot 1, 2, 3, and 4 all know, and also the Cobots or the robots that are at different places in the world might also know. So we share this all among them. Yeah. So one more question? No, then let's uh, thank Manuel again. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting.